In this lesson, we're going to be distinguishing between SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. We're going to take everything we've learned about you know, our substitution reactions, our elimination reactions, and using that to distinguish which mechanism or mechanisms we're using in any given reaction and how we should approach predicting our products. And if at the end of this you're looking for some practice problem, check out Chad's Prep. I've got my Ultimate Organic Chemistry course, as well as my Organic Refresher for the ACS Standardized Final Exam, both of which include plenty of practice problems. Okay, let's take a look here. Now, we've already kind of examined uh, and compared SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 for the substrate, uh, the, the preferred nucleophile or base, and some characteristics of the solvent, the leaving group, and things of this sort. Uh, but when you're comparing these uh, four different mechanisms, trying to decide which one, the single most helpful factor is going to be your nucleophile slash base. So we can see that uh, SN2 wants a strong nucleophile, E2 wants a strong base, and then SN1 wants a weak nucleophile, and E1 wants a weak base. Uh, and normally that's going to be your greatest determining factor. We'll find out uh, that water and alcohols are the most common weak nucleophiles, weak bases. And they're both at the same time. Uh, there's no such, you know, you're not going to deal with anything that's a weak nucleophile but not a weak base, or a weak base that's not a weak nucleophile that's going to be relevant uh, uh, for doing SN1 and E1. And so uh, water and alcohols and maybe even a carboxylic acid on occasion. So if you're dealing with any of those, they're going to be doing both SN1 and E1. Uh, and almost always they'll compete with each other. Um, and you'll predict a pair of products in most cases. And next up on our list, we've got uh, some reactions that are strong nucleophiles and only strong nucleophiles. Being a strong nucleophile, they'll do SN2, but being weak bases, we don't have to worry about E2 competing, and so largely they're just going to do SN2, and we find out that most of these strong nucleophiles have a negative charge, so just like we saw back uh, in our lesson on substitution reactions, uh, but there are some on sulfur, nitrogen, or phosphorus that are neutral that are still strong nucleophiles, but most of those aren't going to you know, show up in most of your exams. So. For the rest of these, though, you'll notice that we've got a negative charge, and more importantly, that there's not a negative charge on an oxygen atom. So typically, if you've got, a, in this chapter, a negative charge on anything other than oxygen, it's probably just a strong nucleophile. Now, it turns out, I mean, that's not a great absolute rule. There are negative charges, like on nitrogen and stuff like this, and NaNH2, that is both a strong nucleophile and a strong base. But for this chapter, we'll find out that it's really helpful. If you have a negative charge on anything other than oxygen, it's probably just a strong nucleophile. And if you have a negative charge on oxygen, it'll be a strong base as well. And if it's bulky, then we'll table that in a second here as well. All right, so, and these guys, <laughs> All being strong nucleophiles but weak bases again, they're probably just going to be doing SN2. So finally, like we just talked about, if you've got a negative charge on oxygen like hydroxide or uh, a non-bulky alkoxide like you know maybe sodium methoxide, sodium ethoxide, sodium isopropoxide, anything along those lines, because they're both strong nucleophiles and strong bases, as strong nucleophiles they want to do SN2 and as strong bases they want to do E2. Now these two we can distinguish between. Uh, we'll find out if they're bulkier like tertiary or secondary, you're either doing only or mostly E2. And if they're not so bulk, uh, if they're not so uh, hysterically hindered, like primary and methyl halides, then you're probably doing mostly or only SN2. Uh, and that's kind of, being kind of the general pattern. So, you know, is backside attack favored or hindered? And finally, we'll look at our bulky bases. And again, for most of you, you're just going to be dealing with T-butoxide. Uh, but for those of you that came across DBN, DBU, or LDA, great, you got some other bulky bases. Uh, and being a bulky base, he is not the greatest nucleophile in the world. So he usually isn't going to be doing SN2. So you're probably just doing E2. Now, technically, T-butoxide can do SN2 on a methyl halide. Uh, and it's not so much that he's just a good nucleophile all of a sudden, uh, but E2 is not possible on a methyl halide. To form a carbon-carbon double bond in an elimination reaction, you have to have two carbons, and methyl halides don't. Um, so that'd be the one case where T-butoxide does SN2 for methyl halide, but for anything else, you're going to be predicting E2 as the major product instead. Cool, let's go take a look at some examples. All right, so we'll take a look at this first example, and my first question on all of these is going to be, who is your leaving group? Uh, in this case, that hopefully identified that as chlorine. And the only reason I want to know that is that I can identify then that reactant as my substrate. And I actually only want to take a look at the substrate second. First, I want to know who the nucleophile or base is. Um, but if I identify the substrate, at least I won't mistake him for the nucleophile or base. And so in this case, we've got methanol as our nucleophile slash base. And as we already discussed, alcohols are weak nucleophiles and weak bases. And therefore, we are probably doing both SN1 and E1. 
Uh, if we kind of take a look at our substitution elimination map off to the left here, so we'll identify this as a secondary halide. So we're starting right here. And we've got a weak nucleophile weak base, and just as we suspected, we're doing both SN1 and E1. Now, if you're doing SN1 and E1, I highly recommend you draw out your carbocation because sometimes those rearrange. And so in this case, our carbocation is simply going to be a secondary carbocation here, and the adjacent carbons would be no more stable than the one we have, so it's not going to rearrange. And so in this case, we'll draw out our products, and I'll start with that substitution product. And in this case, we are not forming a chiral center, so we don't have to worry about stereochemistry. Uh, and in this case, uh, methanol attacks the carbocation, and when neutral uh, nucleophiles attack, they de get deprotonated typically right after, as this one does, so it's just the OCH3 that ends up there. And also our E1 product will form an alkene either way, and whether I form it adjacent on either side of this carbocation, it's the same thing either way. And so we've got our SN1 product, which is achiral, and we've got our E1 product here, uh, and we're good to go. Well, let's do another. All right, let's take a look at this next example, and my first question for you, as always, is uh, where is your leaving group? And in this case, hopefully you identified that as bromine here, and uh, that makes this molecule your substrate. And again, my goal is not to really find the substrate first, but to find the nucleophile or base first, but at least I know it's not him. Uh, and that leaves it to be this guy here. So, and this guy here, we know he is your bulky base. So he's not a good nucleophile at all. He's your bulky base. And being a bulky base, we should just be thinking that he's probably just going to be doing E2 elimination. So if we go back and take a look here, so at our alpha carbon here, this is a tertiary halide. And so we'll be starting on our substitution elimination map right here. Uh, and in this case, we've got our bulky base. Uh, and there's no option for bulky base here. Uh, if you notice the others, they have like strong bulky base, strong bulky base. But here it's just strong base. And the reason there's only something for strong base is that for a tertiary halide, there is no SN2. So we don't have to worry about SN2. And so normally our bulky base would do E2 and not SN2. But for a tertiary halide, you know, SN2 wasn't even an option. So we're just doing E2 here. Uh, and in this case, if we identify our beta carbons now, so we've got a beta carbon here that's primary, another beta carbon here that's primary, and a beta carbon here that is secondary. And the other thing we got to remember here is that with our bulky base, we are not going after Zaitsev's rule. We're trying to form the Hoffman product as the major product. Uh, so in this case, we should be using one of those primary beta carbons uh, to deprotonate and form our alkene instead. And so for our major product, whether I use this primary up here or this primary down here, they're totally equivalent, doesn't matter. And so uh, there's our major E2 products. Cool. Well, let's take a look at another example. All right. In this next example, my first question for you yet again is, who is your leaving group? And hopefully you identified that as iodine right here. And that's our leaving group, then this molecule is our substrate. And again, my goal is not to identify that substrate, but to rule him out so I can find my nucleophile or base. And in this case, that's going to be NaN3. He is my nucleophile slash base, or as we'll find out in a second, he's not really much of a base, but he is a strong nucleophile. So a strong nucleophile, but weak base. And so in all likelihood, the real, only real mechanism that's open to us is SN2. Uh, in this case, take a back a look at our halide. He is a secondary halide. So here's where we start on the map. And in this case, we've got a strong nucleophile, but weak base. And as we just determined, yep, we're doing SN2. And in this case, we've got an ionic bond here, so plus and minus. So N3 is our nucleophile. And you got to remember with SN2 that it's backside attack. So we get inversion of configuration if it happens at a chiral center, as it does in this example. And so in this case, we'll be placing iodide, which was a wedge, with our azide ion, which is a dash. And there is our major SN2 product. All right, in this next example, again, my question for you is, who is your leaving group? And hopefully identified that as iodine, and that makes this molecule our substrate yet again. And makes it pretty easy that this other molecule must be the nucleophile slash base. And you should notice it's ionic, metal to non-metal here. And you should also notice that you've got a negative charge on oxygen. And if you've got a negative charge on oxygen, this guy's both a strong nucleophile and a strong base. 
and that means that both SN2 and E2 are possible. Uh, now SN2 and E2, if you've got a bulkier halide like tertiary or secondary, it's going to favor E2 or only E2, tertiary's case. Uh, but if it's primary methyl and backside attacks relatively unhindered, then it's going to favor SN2. Uh, so let's go back and take a look at our substrate. In this case, we have a primary alkyl halide. So we'll start right here on the map. That would have ruled out SN1 and E1 anyways, if we hadn't already figured that out. Uh, and in this case, again, we've got both a strong nucleophile and a strong base. And so we see that with a primary halide, SN2 will be the major, backside attack's pretty wide open, and E2 will be the minor. So if we take a look at that major first, we'll just replace, uh, let's do that in black, be consistent here. So replace that iodine with an OCH3, our nucleophile, and we're, this is not occurring at a, uh, at a chiral center, so we don't have to worry about inversion or anything like that. And uh, we could also be doing E2, which in which case we'd be forming the alkene instead. And there's only one beta carbon possible, so only one possible alkene we could even form. And so here's our major SN2 product, didn't have to worry about inversion. And here's our major E2 product. And again, we said that SN2 is the major overall product, but E2 is going to be the minor product. All right, we're going to do one last example here. And uh, the number of examples we've done is by no means enough for you to be a master at this point. So you're going to want to do uh, you know, a significant number uh, of additional problems here. And uh, I'd recommend keeping that substitution elimination map handy and use it as you work through some problems. And you'll find that the more problems you do, the less you have to refer to it till eventually you won't have to refer to it at all. And if you're looking for good practice problems, again, I got a couple of good uh, OCHEM courses on chadsprep.com, both of which have copious amounts of practice. All right, so my first question for you is, yet again, who is your leaving group? And hopefully I identified that as bromine here, and that means this molecule, yet again, is your substrate. And again, my goal is really to rule him out so that I can find my nucleophile slash base. And in that case, that's NaOH. And with a negative charge on oxygen, again, that's how we're recognizing our strong nucleophile slash strong bases. And as a result, both SN2 and E2 are possible. So let's go back and take a look. And if we look at this carbon right here, he is a tertiary carbon. And for tertiary carbons, we see that SN2 is not even possible. So therefore, in this case, we don't have to worry about SN2 competing, and it's only going to be E2. And notice I didn't put strong base or bulky base, or because it doesn't matter when you're tertiary. If you got a, any sort of strong base, you're just doing E2 because SN2 is not possible. All right, so go back and take a look. Our alpha carbon, again, is the one with the halogen. And in this case, we've got two different beta carbons. We've got this one right here, which is primary. And we've got this one over here, which is tertiary. And Mr. Zaitsev is going to rule the day. We don't have a bulky base or anything like that. So we're going to follow Zaitsev's rule, and we're going to use the tertiary carbon. Uh, now, in this case, our beta carbon only has the one hydrogen, and that's a problem. If you only have one beta hydrogen here, then if E and Z are possible for your alkene product, you're only going to get one of the two, and you've got to figure out which one that is. Uh, and so in this case, I'm going to kind of cheat. Rather than rotate this around, I'm just going to cheat and say, well, I'm going to look at those phenyl groups. Notice those two phenyl groups, they're 180 degrees apart right now. So if this reactant is ready to go, which we'll find out it's not, but if it were, then they would get locked 180 degrees apart in the product. And then those methyl groups would fill in the other two positions. And so we see that we'd get the E isomer. This is the E isomer. But the bromine here and the hydrogen here are not anti-periplanar right now. With the bromine being a wedge uh, facing down, the hydrogen would be, need to be a dash facing up. And so in this case, if the reactant were ready to go, this is our product. Since it's not ready to go, then this is not our product. And so rather than having to you know, draw this out and rotate it, I just take this advantage that this is not my product, so it must be Z instead. And so in this case, I'll just draw my two phenyl groups both pointing down here and my two methyl groups both pointing up. And that is indeed my Z isomer and our major product through E2.